Jin charms the unactive, the desperate and crazy of either sex, and makes the starving sot behold his rags and nakedness with stupid indolence. It is a fiery lake that sets the brain in flame, burns up the entrails and scorches every part within, and, at the same time, a lethe of oblivion in which the wretch, immersed, drowns. Social philosopher Bernard Mandeville wrote this most unflattering account on the effects of gin in his 1714 political study entitled The Fable of the Bees or Private Vices, Public Benefits. Mandeville held many an opinion on how private vice influenced society, but what was it of this most public of vices, the excessive indulgence in mother gin, that compelled him to pen such a damning account of our most beloved tipple. If we were to hitch a ride with our esteemed friend Mr. Wells on his glorious time machine and set our date and location to 16th century Northern Europe, we might arrive to discover that the juniper berry was still riding a wave of medicinal popularity for apparently successfully treating the Black Death some 200 years earlier. Equally popular was Yenava, a triple malted spirit of Belgium Dutch origin which used the juniper berry and other tasty herbs to make the somewhat crude distillate of the time a little bit more palatable to the populace. Also at this time, the Dutch were being, well, rather Dutch and were in the throes of asserting their independence from Spain in the Eighty Years' War. During this rather lengthy fight for independence, the Dutch East India Trading Company was becoming quite the superpower, and what was their employee's faithful travelling companion? None other than the beloved Nineveh. Additionally, with an almost complete monopoly on the spice routes of the day, the creative Dutch distillers had access to a fabulous array of exotic botanicals with which to experiment, and over the decades, Yenova became quite the sophisticated spirit. Meanwhile in England, Queen Elizabeth I wasn't so fond of the Spanish either, and so in 1585 sent the Earl of Leicester and around 6,000 troops to help the Dutch in their struggle for independence. The English soon noted that their Dutch allies took a nip of spirit before entering the battlefield to gift them a little shot of Dutch courage, as it were. With this observation, so began the gradual introduction of Yenova to English society. But even with its complex flavours and touted medicinal benefits, Yenova was by no means an instant hit in England, and brandy and beer were still the tipple of choice for many years. This culture changed, however, in 1688, when the Protestant Dutchman William III of Orange overthrew Catholic King James II of England in the Glorious Revolution. William was a proud Protestant and wasn't too keen on Catholic France, so in an attempt to undermine their economy, he severely limited the import of their brandy. Yes indeed friends, some trade tactics will never change. With these new trade restrictions came a vigorous patriotic promotion of locally produced spirits to support the nation's grain farmers. The population responded with gusto, and England soon became a nation where drinking spirits was popular across all social demographics. Tally ho! And so, dear friends, I imagine you are here with me today because you, as I, do rather enjoy gin. But I wonder whether you enjoy it as much as the general populace of 18th century London, because let me just say, they were rather enamoured with the stuff. It is again our friend Mandeville who introduces us to the first appearance of the word gin on the printed page. The infamous liquor the name of which derived from the juniper berries in Dutch is no, by frequent use, from a word of middling length shrunk into a monosyllable, intoxicating gin. With the new patriotic Protestant promotion of locally distilled spirits came a new distilling act announced by William in 1690. Citizens could now proudly distill their own homemade concoctions simply by posting a notice, waiting 10 days, and then getting straight to it. The Distilling Act itself specified no regulations, no licensing costs, and definitely no quality standards. 
Unsurprisingly, the production of spirits increased quite dramatically. It is thought that the jinns of the era were up to double the strength of our modern counterparts when created with water likely contaminated with raw sewage and adulterated with sulfuric acid or turpentine or maybe lime oil. It is also speculated that they may have tasted more akin to rubbing alcohol than the divine drop that we enjoy today. Affordability and ease of production meant the market exploded and gin became available in street markets, in grocers, chandlers, barbers and no doubt brothels. And the health giving properties of gin were touted in ballads and poems. Gin will provide you strength throughout the day, it will cure all your various ailments and restore your libido thus making you a much better spouse. For the first time women were also attracted to drinking with the vision of sipping gin daintily from a lovely cup seemed to be rather in vogue and stylish. Gin was fast becoming an entrenched part of Britain's cultural identity. Fondly named Mother Gin, she was seen as a figure to help fire up the troops of war, support the farmers and rouse a nation to glory. She was rather much like Britannia really, but just a tad more boozy. Gin became especially popular with the poor as for many it offered a quick release from the unending misery of everyday life. Gin shops themselves became known for the phrase drunk for a penny, dead drunk for threepence, clean straw for nothing. With gin shops commonly housing a straw lined room at the rear of the premises for the convenience of the unconscious patron. It is believed that the phrase saved by the bell arose from a drinking public who were so very paranoid about being buried alive after an epic drinking sesh that safety coffins were devised. These coffins contained a little bell, ding ding, that could be rung to call the attention to the fact that you'd been mistakenly buried alive. Another saying gifted to us from the age was mother's ruin. Gin was exceedingly popular with the ladies even though there were reports circulating that consumption of gin in women could lead to spontaneous combustion. This in turn adversely affected their parenting skills and during the gin craze the death rate far outstripped the birth rate. Those children that were born were also not even guaranteed survival with close to one in five children not reaching the age of two. With mass drunkenness and the perceived disintegration of the family now a very serious problem one Lord Harvey observed drunkenness of the common people was universal. The whole town of London swarmed with drunken people from morning till night. Lord Harvey may have had a point. By 1743 gin consumption in Britain had reached a yearly average of 23 litres per person. That's 33 bottles of Hendrix dear friends. And the gin craze had now become a social crisis requiring political intervention. As numerous pamphlets and articles were written denouncing gin as the ruin of society and family life, the demand for reform was finally starting to gain traction. To witness to the general chaos that gin was creating in London, the government became increasingly worried about mobs and insurrection. But more importantly, they were probably just worried about the ability of their working classes to actually keep on working. Parliament introduced the first laws to curb gin production in 1729, however their efforts were a little half-hearted at best. In a story as familiar today as it was back then, lobbying from farmers and distillers whose immense profits relied on gin undermined the effectiveness of any attempts at good regulation. It wasn't until the Gin Act of 1736 entitled The Act for Laying a Duty Upon the Retailers of Spiritous Liquors that any significant progress was made. This act introduced an astronomical license fee of £50 for gin retailers. The act was, unsurprisingly, rather unpopular with the common people. Mother Gin was considered a patriotic symbol of strength, camaraderie and proud Protestantism. Protesters unhappy with the changes embraced their creative side and took to the streets with pithy slogans like No Gin, No King! On the eve of the act passing, people even gathered to toast Mother Gin, with an official funeral for her taking place near Piccadilly. A huge black market soon arose and the production of gin veritably exploded. 
the government attempted to quash the black market by paying informers £5 per instance to report those selling gin illegally. However, as we know, snitches get stitches and many of them ended up beaten, bloodied or just plain missing. The enforcement of the act became so very fraught that even magistrates refused to prosecute offenders. Enter a certain enterprising chap named Captain Dudley Bradstreet, a very English name indeed, who carefully read through the Gin Act to devise an ingenious loophole in which to sell gin. Captain Bradstreet realised that the Act did not give police authority to enter a building if the seller was unknown to them. He persuaded a friend to rent a house and mounted a statue of a cat on its exterior with a leaden pipe coming from its paw. Known as the Puss and Mew, punters seeking their next tipple could approach the statue and ask, Hey Puss, do you have any gin? Whereby the statue would meow and gin would flow forth from the pipe. As Bradstreet was hidden behind the statue, an informer could not identify who had sold them the gin and so the police had no authority to enter the house and arrest him. Bravo, he said. Bravo. The disastrous act was finally repealed in 1743 and a new policy introduced which included both the distillers and the retailers. This settled the situation for some years and by 1751 and the umpteenth iteration of the Gin Act, society was starting to see the beginning of the end of the gin craze. During this period, influential magistrate and writer Henry Fielding was also busily penning many an opinion piece describing how the evils of Mother Gin could be directly linked to the alarming rise of crime in London. Indeed, to drive home his point, it is believed he commissioned a two-part propaganda piece from artist William Hogarth entitled Beer Street and Gin Lane. Beer Street depicts a happy and positive tableau where the populace recline resplendent after a satisfying day's work whilst sipping on beer, the happy produce of our isle. Compare this with its counterpart, Gin Lane, where the notorious slum of St Giles is depicted as overrun with suicide, madness, dying troops and drunk, neglectful mothers. Top this off with a catchy poem down the bottom which begins, Gin, cursed fiend with fury fraught, makes human race a prey. It enters by a deadly draught and steals our life away. There is definitely no mistaking the sentiment of this particular piece. The consumption of gin continued to steadily decline, but it was the year 1757 which really put the final nails in Mother Gin's coffin, as she evidently didn't request one of those safety bells upon her demise. During this year, England's grain harvest was exceptionally crappy, and so the government placed a ban on all distilling to ensure the available crops were actually kept for food. The poor harvest continued the following year, which further inflated the price of food, leaving very little left for your average punter to spend on booze. Other drinks were also gaining popularity, including our beloved tea, which was becoming more affordable, rum was on the rise, and the price of beer once again fell below that of spirits. And so it seemed that London had finally grown up and was able to break free from the boozy bosom of Mother Jim. And so, dear friends, there ends my tale, but I am sure you can agree that 250 odd years later, Mother Gin has certainly not been forgotten. One need only visit your local liquor merchant to discover the absolutely gobsmacking variety of gins on offer, which are thankfully no longer flavoured with sulfuric acid, turpentine or lime oil. No, no. Today's gins are flavoured with an astounding array of botanicals from turmeric to chilli to seaweed and even eucalyptus because yes, here in Australia we have not forgotten the gin drinking koalas. Thankfully though, this century's gin craze has not yet produced crime, infant neglect, propaganda posters or worse still, female spontaneous combustion. So enjoy dear friends. I do hope that you have been sipping on a glass of your favourite whilst watching and I would think it most splendid if you could place your gin recommendations in the comments below. The Brass Harpies are always on the lookout for new and unusual additions to our burgeoning gin collection. And if you are ever in Australia, do come and say hello. We'll make sure that we have some of that eucalyptus stuff on hand. Gin gin everyone! Be harpy!